Well, folks, as you can see, we have a refill back today. I was hoping all the tech. Uh, the technical stuff would be worked out. And is and the title well, of today's video is Aristo's answer to Epicurus. I hope I said that right. <laughs> that's good enough. It's good enough. Okay. Well, I did hear when you when you talked, there was a lot of static coming out on my end. So who knows how how it's going to be presented here? It's very clear right now. Okay. Well, let's take advantage of that. Well, hello again. Um, I'm not on very often, but uh, this time I hope I have done a little bit uh, of research on this topic because Ron has mentioned this over and over again. Uh, it's, it's called a, a, an Epicurean trilemma. And a trilemma is basically, a dilemma is when you have two bad options and you have to pick one of them, you know, the bad or the worst. Uh, a trilemma just means you have three options. Now, technically, this is, may not even be from Epicurus, it's from the Stoic philosopher 2,000 years ago. Um, that uh, they didn't find it in any of his writings. It might either be by some other philosopher, but the philosopher David Hume, um, I believe he was uh, 17th or 18th century or 19th even, I'm not sure. But uh, the English philosopher David Hume said that this was from Epicurus. But he's the one who actually said it, you know, and conveyed it. <clears throat> but it might be from a, a, another, you know, author altogether. Quote, it doesn't matter. What matters is that religious theologians use this in order to affirm the presence of God, and atheists used it, use it, use it in order to deny the presence of God. So the same essentially, thing. They're, they're, the same thing. Yeah, they argue both <laughs> ways. I didn't know you that. Know. That's thank you for bringing that out. <laughs> well, and I, when I did the research, you know, as theology school types were like, well, you might be posed with this dilemma. This is how you answer it, you know. Our Lord Jesus Christ, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I have a different answer. And first of all, I know that any answer I will give is moot because it's an emotional question. I mean, you're not, you don't really want to know how and the reason and the logistics of it. You know, you don't want to know. It doesn't matter. Oh, the mystery. If you can't change it, you know, that would be the only reason to know it. If it gives you some clue to remedy the situation. Uh, what you really want is for the suffering to end and somehow to, to know that, okay, should we rely on some higher power? Should we rely on ourselves? How, what should we rely on? Um, I mean, even if you're an atheist, at least you, you, you basically say, well, this is the deal. So I got to live with it or I got to kill myself. What am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to live with it and I'm going to find out how I, I live with it. In my opinion, if you're living with it in a way that's ultimately meaningless, and something's up because your instincts are telling you something's different. Now, the materialist will say it doesn't matter what your instincts say, they lie, they're adapted to something completely different. Somebody else will say, who's more in tune with their instincts, no, uh, my sense of meaning comes from who I am, and who I am is a part of what all this is, so I can't be that disconnected. You know, I can be disconnected in a whole bunch of maladaptive ways, but my deepest sense of meaning as a self-aware being is that, uh, you know, something is missing here. You know, what is it? How is it? So a second point is, besides the fact that, well, any philosophical answer doesn't really help you emotionally. That's a whole other story. A second answer is, um, you know, does it really matter at all? Or, or the fact is, so what? Or you'll hear about it and it's like, well, this doesn't help me because I want it to end. And even information wise, all it can do is go over your head because the logical statement is presented to us clearly, concisely, so we can have a, expect an answer like, like that. So somebody can say, well, uh, the fact is God is either this, that, or the other. So, well, yeah, God is good and all powerful. And the reason that evil exists is this. Okay. Very, oh, that's what it is. Okay. You know, and, but that's, if it was that easy, then the answer would have been right there. And we would have been using it. But the thing is, we need to understand that all religion stems from mystical experience, or it's bullshit. Unless the religion stems from uh, experiences of contacting the mystery that the religion is supposed to promote, then 
it's just a myth. It's just a story somebody made up. It's all in your head, you know. Experience is, and people go to church to have experiences. It's supposed to be a communion experience, really. It's a mass meditation type thing, that whole ritual of bring the divine into the presence of, of a congregation, for example. Now, although I'm not a religious person, I'm going to speak in religious terms, and I'm going to use biblical terms a little bit. Because you, it's not so simple also, because you've got to ask yourself, well, first of all, what is God? There is this conception of the divine that goes from one point to the other on the spectrum all over the world. So what are we talking about? Second, what the hell is evil? You know, is evil just some boogeyman term? Because it seems that, that, that people really, they either deny it completely or they don't understand, you know, or else they gloss over it. Because if you say evil is just an illness or something, people tend to go, okay, uh, or it doesn't exist, or it's just in the eye of the beholder, you know. But if you say that it's the boogeyman, you create a psychological response that basically keeps you well. That means I got to be ultra defensive. This is bad. I have to really be on my guard against this, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to keep your kids, for example, from having an accident, you know, from burning their hands on the stove, you might scare them about the stove and the bad, bad things that fire can do to them. Uh, you know, that's not really right in my opinion, but people do that and it is effective. You know, all of these people of a certain race, color, or creed are bad. We all look at them a certain way. We never contact them. We never confirm if it's bad or good. You know, because we have been warned and it's better safe than sorry. So we need to understand a little bit what evil is. Uh, third, we need to understand, you know, the mystical aspect of it. Because you, people who say, well, why? What's this going to do for me? Well, if it can't do anything for you, then it's just a matter of faith, you know, because mysticism is applied religion. It's also applied magic, and it's also applied, you know, magic is applied mysticism, uh, and mysticism is the basis of religion. Religion is actually supposed to be applied mysticism. That, that's how it was supposed to work. Because people don't all have these experiences, but they want to benefit from them. So someone in the community has mystical experiences. They become a shaman. They, they are able to heal. They can advise. They have insight, this, that, and the other. They can prophecy. They can, you know, predict things. This helps the community. They become a shaman. Then everybody else congregates around that source of inspiration in order to get from it. And so religions are born. Now, if you got the guy, the shaman, being a con artist, then it's a whole other story. He can get the congregation to do all manner of stuff. And the way they do that is to be very, very simplistic, you know, because a lot of religions, you know how Jesus would have the internal teachings, the real teachings, to a select group of people, and then everybody else got parables. You know, everybody else got basically stories, you know, the parable of the, you know, merchant, the parable of the king, the parable of this, that, you know, the bridegroom. And these things were allegories of the mystical experiences. Now, to his own disciples, or 500 or so, I read somewhere, there were people who were following him. He said, no, look, what I'm really talking about this, that, and the other. Um, and then to a select group, maybe just 12, 13, who knows, including women, um, he said, uh, well, no, this is really the secret practice. This is how you meditate. This is how you focus. This is if you really want the Father. So the thing is, uh, what am I when he says, like, you cannot, who is the Father? Who is uh, the Holy Ghost? You know, since it's you, in other words, that is expressing all of this, this dilemma, uh, which I shall get to in a minute. We need to define God in terms that you do, you know. So, but still be within the realm of, say, mysticism, okay? I'm not being canonically Christian in this case, but I'm not being Hindu either or pagan or anything like that. I'm going to go from a monotheist, mystical thing. I'll include a little bit of Kabbalah in there, you know, Jewish mysticism, because they're also in the same line of perception. <clears throat> so... This dilemma, basically, it says, it, it, it has this. Uh, it takes two qualities, and these qualities are ability and willingness. Okay, so you have God, you say, so let's use that term, and you have ability and willingness. So either you have 
yes for ability and yes for willingness. So God is both willing and able to help us. Uh, or God is unwilling and unable to help us. Willing and unable or unwilling and able. Okay? So two yeses, two noes, a yes and a no, and a no and a yes. Okay? <laughs> so there's four, four categories. Now they call it a trilemma because when you consider a God that's, that's unwilling and unable, you know, you might as well be considering a person, you know. So it's basically some nasty person who's too weak to do anything but wouldn't do anything even if they, if they could. So that's discarded. So it's three options. So um, if it, you take those three options and, and logically you say, well, you know, look, man, if he would have, could have done anything and he wanted to do something, he or she and she would have done it. So why isn't it done? Well, basically, if God is willing and unable, we're talking about some I'm willing and unable to, you know. So again, it could be just anybody. So that's not God. So if God is able but unwilling, then you're dealing with some kind of sicko. You know, basically, or sicko, or for some reason indifferent. Now, why would a creature like, why would a essence like that create, even create? Oh, they created creation to just mess with it, to poke at it and destroy it. You know, that's that's completely sick because the whole love aspect is not a sham. So God created us wanting to be loved, but never, you know, basically that's a psychopath's, uh, you know, design. A psychopath's dream, a psychopath's wet dream of divinity. If the, if the psychopaths all become godlike, that like they claim, that's a, what they're going to do. That's their ambition: to be willing, uh, unwilling, and able, able to bestow blessings, but unwilling to do so, and in your face, maybe giving you false hope. So the point is, that kind of creation is unsustainable. Because to really resolve this trilemma, you don't really look at God so much and what God is. That's the problem. That's why it's unresolvable. You have to understand the context. And the context is creation. It's us. It's the universe. Okay, so the fact is that God here is defined as follows, with three attributes. And this is, this is what I would call the Holy Trinity. It's love, presence, and power. If God is just love but can't do crap, you know, then there's no point. If God is just power, then again, you know, that power it can be abused. If God is just presence, that's a passive awareness. Buddhism-type mysticism, you know, certain types that basically are monistic and believe in transcending and leaving the earth and going and uniting with the one, so to speak, um, that they believe in presence. And reject the power is an illusion, and uh, even the love is secondary because that's supposed to be one with the presence. So these ideas of, of how they manipulate these things, and also some people emphasize love because that's, that's the easiest thing for a human being to basically experience if they can overcome their trauma. Presence requires a lot of meditation. It's a consciousness thing. It's the third eye upper chakra thing. Um, and power is also ambiguous. You know, occultists usually go for that. The point is that you can identify love with the son or the child aspect, the heart. You can identify presence with the father aspect, the mind of God, the consciousness part. You can identify power as the will or desire or energy of God. And that would be the female aspect, the maternal aspect. It would also be the distortion that became the Holy Spirit, you know, because the spirit of holiness in, in ancient, in, in Hebrew mysticism, is the inner bride. That's what they call it. See, in your soul, there's a bride that cries for the groom, which is God. So God comes down and a sacred marriage happens inside. And this sacred marriage gives the birth of the so-called son. And through the son, then you can realize everything. So you, in a way, there's a, there's a process going on on how the human being does this. Now you go, well, what does this have to do with God being willing and able? The essence is this. Let's go to the Bible, to the first verse, in the beginning, okay? Now, that is a translation that could be rendered also differently. 
because the the preposition, the first letter B in Bereshit, is basically a preposition that says inside something, with something, or by something. So it could be translated by the beginning or by a beginning. With a beginning, God created heaven and earth. In other words, by instituting causality. Because before that, there was nothing, no time. There was no beginning, no ending. There was no reference like that. But at that point, the first thing that was created was time meaning a beginning, say, okay, from this point on, we're gonna do things this, we're, we're starting something. So with a beginning, with a definite <clears throat> line drawn in the sand, so to speak, a reference frame, there was actually more than just a unified field of one thing, one essence. It was the one thing that, a reference frame. Now, what happened, how could this happen though? You're talking about God. So we say that the divine creates out of nothing. But in this case, what is nothing? What can actually be worthy of relativity for something as absolute as divine love, divine presence, and divine power, which are actually one thing? <clears throat> well, that is the contradiction of all of those. The complete not love, not presence, and no power. So the void then, if it doesn't have any presence, it's a blank and unconscious. If it has no power, it doesn't do anything, but it doesn't have any love either. So it's really not a pleasant place to be. And in fact, if, you, if this void acts like a mirror, because here's what happens. All that is, says the mystic, is God in the beginning, okay, or before, right before the beginning happens, so to speak. And it's one unified, you know, there's no such thing as nothing. However, for God to create a beginning, God has to create nothing. Before God can create out of nothing, God has to create nothing. So you, to do that, it's called the divine contraction. Basically, it's like this. Everything is God. So how do you have something that isn't God? You know, that doesn't just become one again, that just blend in because the power and the glory and all of this are so big, are so, you know, absolute that you can't really separate anything from it out of the blue. So what you have to do, what the uh, Isaac Luria, for example, in the 15th century, 16th century Kabbalist, you know, and this, this theory is like a model to try to understand this. It's called the great contraction. A portion of this great infinite field shrunk and separated from the other part and became a little center, local. And then between this portion, you can do it in circles. So you have a circle that's divine inside, then you have this band that's basically a withdrawal where God doesn't say, I'm not there, a denial, basically. I am not there, which means anything that is there is the complete opposite of me. So we can have a field that becomes the field where creation takes place. But this field must remain absolutely neutral. Neutral. It must be asleep. And it's almost like the essence within the circle is looking out at the void, but what turns and looks back is the opposite. It's a nasty bee. It's an illusion, of course, but it's still a nasty bee. So somehow the loving God uh, didn't understand what this was because this never happened. See, we say about omniscience, and omniscience is right when you're, this big, uh, you know, omni field of absoluteness. But once you go into creation, once you say with a beginning, because didn't the Bible also say that the face of God was staring into the deep? You know, so what is the deep? You know, it's not like the earth, all of a sudden the earth was void and, and you know, mud and mire and all of this and this chaos. This is basically the withdrawal because what God wanted to create was something separate, something autonomous, something individual, many, multiplicity, and infuse all that because God creates out of nothing, but God also creates out of God, okay? And we're talking male and female aspects and everything, the whole trinity, the love between them and the polarity that can happen. This happens as a creation process that works with the void, with negation. So you basically need this thing that isn't God to participate in the creation process if you're going to create independent entities that have free will. 
So evil is in there. You can't go around it because God has to create something that never existed before, that wasn't there. Uh, it, it existed because of the beginning happened, or it existed in the locality of this beginning. The beginning is the contraction. Basically, the first word of God was no, I'm not there. Right there is where creation is going to be. And then let's all embody it, you know. Let's give it space. And so we don't, it doesn't become one with the whole essence. And then let's let it grow. So it has to grow in this environment. It has to grow through contact with what we call evil. Evil is just, you know, the negation of what we are. It says no. Backwards. Everything's backwards, yes. <laughs> but it doesn't have to go backwards. All it has to do is just turn away from you so you can have a space because then it makes a space. It's insubstantial. You know, it's not real. That's the lie. But when you get caught up in the lie, then it becomes a part of you and your whole makeup is created to be adapted to having that lie inside of you. So... But this is what acted like the support in some way to create form, to actually establish some sort of permanence of autonomy. The next step is to extract this part that shouldn't even be there, to basically let it go neutral. That's our job. So in a way, the only answer you can give to Epicurus is a variant of, oh, God moves in mysterious ways. It's not really that. I don't believe that. What I believe is that because we're talking about the essence of everything, and it's all always a part of us, part of our very soul, the so-called divine will should be natural to us. You know, you can't understand the whole magnitude, whatever, but to the point that you're human, it should make sense. That's what religionists say. That's why they say, oh, here's the word of God for people. We wrote it in a book so you idiots can understand it, you know. And, and, but it's all literal and it's all verbatim because you're so stupid you can't think for yourselves. No, that's not the way it would go because the truth is in your heart. Maybe you need something to put it into words or a reference frame or a few stories to help you, <coughs> excuse me, to help you really uh, tune into it because there's so many distractions. Again, this is really a religious point of view in some ways, but at the same time, it's saying that, look, there is a mystical process. If you really want to understand these things, you've got to go into a mystical process, and that is very hard work. It demands, it's not just meditating for a little bit every day or a few hours every day and having peace of mind. It's going into depths of alternate frames of awareness which are very challenging because you have to combine your own crap, your own baggage, your own karma with energies that, that are beyond you, you know, and visions and revelations and try to put this in the context. And then you have to really see uh, what the Apostle Paul, regardless of what you think, but we're just going with the flow here, what the Apostle Paul said about principalities and, you know, about the world being under... What, what was it like principalities and principalities and powers is powers, the way it was powers, worded. Powers. Yeah. Yeah. But again, and Paul also has some, some part where he was telling slaves to be obedient to their masters, you know, and be good, good slaves because that's the way God wanted it uh, or women to be obedient to men and, and stuff. Uh, and, and because that's the way society was. So principalities and powers can be our psychopaths or they can be spiritual principalities and powers. The fact remains that there's a lot out there that is afflicted with the situation, not just of the world. It's not just the earth. It's anything that occurred after the beginning. <laughs> so if you want to go to some other planet and think it's actually paradise and we're the only ones in some backwater swamp, you know, part of the universe, you got another thing coming. <clears throat> there is a theory that, that's called rare earth theory that we really were really – very few planets in creation will actually have life. Or what I would say is that intelligent life is at this point afflicted with an unresolved situation in creation. So any civilization that tries to pop up is going to have the same problems we are. You know, it's going to go through the same patterns because it's 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 up here that these patterns start. 
you know, you're, you're coming out of a biological situation where survival of the so-called fittest, we have to eat, we have to kill to eat, the environment is competitive, it's not really paradisial. And if it were paradisial, then there is another competitive environment out there that's going to come over and get you at some point. So you're either going to be too weak to fend off the enemy, or you're going to be too corrupt to be able to sustain your own civilization or anything. So the point is, it's not about God, even though I've been talking about that for so long. The point is that if God were to change everything, creation wouldn't exist anymore, you know, because it would have to tear everything apart. So separate the wheat from the chaff very violently, very abruptly, very quickly, and what would be left would be just an image of God that actually knows it's God. So all of your experience and individuality would just become part of divine experience. That's what some New Agers and mystics say, is that, oh, we die, we all, spirits go back to the Creator, and that's what He wants. He wants us to be back in the Creator, uh, to tell Him our stories and, you know, share our experiences or have them all become one. No. The purpose of creation is relationship. That's it. What can you do with relationship? How far can you take relationship? That is the purpose of creation. So if the creator is just going to pull everything back from the void, so to speak, and make it void free, then relationship is gone. There's no point to it. It was all, all that trouble for nothing because when we suffer, God suffers. We are all having the spirit. It's not, I mean, we might experience it as separation, but from the divine perspective, it's all there. So it's a strange situation of uh, that if you really want to get into a deeper sense of it, um, logical analysis is not going to help you. There's too many variables. There's too many things that don't fit into linear logic. Uh, mystical experience would opening into some insight. But the point is that it is a process. Some people say, well, it's going to take thousands of years. See, that's irrelevant because time is different on the big scale and it's different on the little scale. And the point is, for this redemption to occur, the big and the little scales need to marry. That's what many mystical traditions say, the macrocosm and the microcosm, as above, so below. They need to basically reflect each other clearly. The so-called angels will only help you if you're a clear reflection of, of what they represent. You know, they can, so there's a resonance, so, you know, allegorically speaking. In other words, what I'm saying is that even religious traditions, if you really examine the situation, they will give you an explanation of this, that, yeah, there is a process here, because we're dealing with anti-God that has been given powers almost equivalent to God, but is not really God, it's not really real as, a, as an entity. But because the first thing that any pure being wants to do is embrace and love, you go and embrace the shadow, and then the shadow kills you, you know, or becomes one with you, but this shadow isn't supposed to be inside of you. Your shadow is supposed to be out there. The light casts a shadow. It's, you're not supposed to inhale it in your being and have you become shadow-like because then it consumes you. This interaction is the one relationship that essence has learned that it's not supposed to be. You know, what you call true evil, what we call all kinds of things that are really not evil. They may be weakness, they may be violent, they may be painful, but the true intent to annihilate existence is this anti-God, it's the lack of the presence of God. Essence or the field or the void itself will present that when the so-called blessing isn't there. But the blessing is here within us. We feel that. You feel like you have a core soul, and then there's this crazy chaos around you, and somewhere out there, there must be some God, you know. So we, too, are creating into the void. We are in the image and likeness. It's just that the stories that they fed us are there to disempower us. So they play upon how difficult the understanding is. They play upon philosophical complexity on the one hand, or emotional uh, immaturity on the other hand, to say that, look, we are evolving. 
And so, yeah, there's a perfect God out there or in here and all of this, but the grand scope is way beyond that. God has to be perfect and imperfect if it's going to encompass everything. And we're the imperfect part that is evolving into the perfecting of the art of, at, at a cosmic level, of relationship, of what love is. But love, power, and presence. So um, it's, it's something that I urge you to your hearts to say, well, don't try to define God. Those of you not like atheists or just seeing spirituality in a different way, those of you who, who want to stick to that concept is look at the Trinity, and, and even in a monotheistic way, just look at the Trinity of love, power, and presence. And what would this want to do when it's dealing with a delicate creation that has to be like doing a delicate operation, but at a divine level, something that would even be a challenge for, for God, let's put it that way. Not just as a grand architect like the Freemasons see it, but something that's embodying the process through us. We are the embodiment of divinity. We are meant to be that. And that's where the shoe has trouble fitting. And, and the Jews say that, well, the world has been created, destroyed, created, destroyed, because all these options were done. None of them worked. Some of them were too perfect, so could hold the light. Some of them were too rigid. Some were too flexible. So we have to know that this is not a point. You can abandon hope. Hope is something that is opium. However, faith is different. Faith is when you have a conviction and said, look, you know, this is the path that I believe is a worthy one. You know, I'm not just going to sit here and hope everything works out, but I am going to have the faith that my actions are aligned with something else. That's what I feel. I may not see it. It may not be happening on a global scale. But the fact that things are seeming to get worse might actually be good news because the more you stir the hornet's nest, the more the hornets are going to come out and bite you. So let's hope we can stir it in a way that's not going to be too painful or even painful at all, because we can. Where some of us, there are levels of solutions. So this isn't something, I'm, I'm running a little extra, but I just want to say this isn't something that everybody needs to grab and, and go behind. This is an answer to say that you can have faith, and I don't fault religious people when they're not, <coughs> excuse me, when they're not being oppressive to others, just as I don't fault atheists or whatever, when they're not being oppressive to others. You need to understand that human nature, non-psychopathic human nature, we have more in common than we think, you know, whether we're atheists or not or whatever. Indeed. You know, we actually believe our meaning is described a different way. It may seem ultimately different, but really, our heart, if we're not psychopaths or, or completely traumatized or even blinded by our own fear, which many are, even if we're brainwashed, the heart is mostly in the right place. So I will leave you with that. Sorry for going a little bit extra. And uh, that's it for today. It doesn't answer the question definitively, but at least it gives a, a some food for thought so you don't think that the dilemma is actually a logical fallacy or that your only choice is to say there's nothing, you know, like some people say. That's too quick to judge. This is a philosophical question, which means thinking needs to be involved in understanding what everything is, okay? So don't give up. Don't despair. There is an out. Uh, but faith is better than hope and love is better than all of them, so. That's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Aristo.